Time now. This will be the last uh, before we take our break, and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, back on schedule. I'm not sure how we're doing, what we're doing. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about structure, and I'd like to sort of give maybe some background. I mean, you know, we've been hearing some talks today about various ideas about structure, and I just want to maybe before I even start the talk is maybe ask the larger question: What are all these models for? I mean, why are we doing this? Why are we thinking of you know, why are we thinking of loops? Why loops? I mean, why isn't it something else? You know, I, and, uh, and what I want to just point out is that in all of these models, in fact, uh, there are many others. I mean, uh, Bill did some stuff today. Don did some stuff. We have Vladimir Ginsburg. We have uh, uh, Stoyan Sarg. We have a number of people. Obviously, the people from Common Sense Science, Dr. Lucas is here today, have been advocating uh, models that are based on, you know, sometimes they call it ether or energy moving. Uh, you know, I happen to think charge is, it's, but maybe a primal sort of charge that's neither positive nor negative. But, but something is circulating. That's one common theme that we're seeing in virtually all these models is that they, they emphasizing the idea that these are not static models, these are dynamic models, and that there's something moving and that the motion itself is actually causing the compression. We, we know this happens in physics from the Bernoulli effect or the Finch effect, Empyrean law, uh, all these kinds of things. When something moves, as, it, as if like passing water passing through a pipe, the faster it moves, the more it pinches. So it is actually the motion, because the same amount of matter has to pass through adjacent cross sections, when it moves faster, it pinches. And if that's actually what's causing the thing to condense or to, to, uh, to adhere, to become a, you know, a, a particle or to become a piece of matter. And so that's the idea, is, is what is the way in which this stuff is circulating around so that it holds itself together? That's kind of the underlying thing behind, I think, a lot of these structural models. At least that's how it works in my mind. So I'm going to talk about one in particular today. Uh, a guy named Tom Lockyer has come up with his models. And I, so I'm going to interject from time to time maybe some more general comments because I'm not necessarily um, talking about just his model. I want to get sort of some ideas about structure in general. But I also want to... Uh, emphasize the fact that it's one thing to say, hey, this is the model, and I think this is, this is what the electron looks like, and that's great. But it's another thing to sit down and do the math with it and say, hey, you know, let's, let's figure out what these fields would look like. Let's apply some equations to it and see if that really works. And that's one of the things I've been trying to do and one of the things I'd like to see more of. And um, so anyway, I, I did attempt to do a little bit of that with uh, Tom Lockyer's model. And I found some good things about it, and I found some things maybe not as is good. I'll let you decide for yourself. So let's go ahead and talk about that model. So the goals of this talk, I want to introduce to you, obviously, the Lockyer cube model. Most of you probably are not familiar with it. And then I'm going to set up the analysis. And a lot of that is just I had to come up with my own little notation to be able to identify how I wanted to look at this thing. So I'll, I'll spend some various time on that. That in itself is an interesting thing. If we just stop there, I think it'd be kind of interesting. And then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the paths around a cube. And so I'm going to have to exhaust you know, basically, I'm going to find all the possibilities by exhausting everything that is possible. So I'll be doing that, and then I'll uh, assess the model, talk about you know what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, um, and finish it off with talking about particle structures in general and how we can learn from them. So that's kind of the overall idea of what I'm going to be doing today. And this is Tom Locke here himself, and uh, he's written several papers for the NPA. He's also written several books, which I've read them all. <laughs> Here they are, I wrote one, first one in 1992, Vector Particle Physics, and I'm gonna be talking about that right there. There was uh, five little pictures that he wrote over 20 years ago for that book. Uh, he wrote a couple, of, another set of books here not that long ago, Fundamental Physics and Constants, um, Physical Constants, derived from particle structures. Now that appeals to me like crazy because I, I personally believe that it's possible to find out what, what is 1836, where does that come from? Where does, you know, where does, that's the, uh, the proton to electron ratio. That, that doesn't, there's, not a, there's a reason for that number, and we should be able to figure it out in terms of models at some point. We should be able to figure out why the muon is 207 times, you know, roughly the size of the electron. All of these things, these numbers, that's my passion. I want to I wanna figure out those things, and I believe that the way to figure them out is to figure them out in terms of models. So that's where I'm coming from when I'm looking at this. When I look at Tom Lockyer's stuff, when I look at Don Burdell's stuff, that's what I'm thinking. And by the way, I want to just share something. I read this on the plane um, coming in here, and it was just too good not to share. So I'm going to read just a couple paragraphs, or just a, just a couple sentences from it here. It says here, it is frequently held that mathematics develops most effectively when it is closely associated with the world of practical affairs, when scholars and artisans work together. 
However, to the, this general rule, there seems to be more exceptions than there are instances of it. And the discovery of analytic geometry, this is a book on analytic geometry, certainly seems to be one of those exceptions. So the point the author is making is that uh, the, the great advances in mathematics and perhaps in physics have not come because we're trying to solve a particular problem. They, they've come for different reasons. People have a passion about something. And so uh, that's my excuse to come here and play with toys today because I think there's value in doing that and looking at models and trying to assess those things. And maybe uh, indirectly coming up with the ultimate goal, which is I really want to understand how structure works and how nature works. But I don't know. This particular thing is going to get us there today, but it maybe give us some clues as to how to go about doing that. So that's what I'll be doing today. All right. Um, so the question I have in mind now: What is what is a particle? Well, there's a lot of options. We could say, well, you know, it's a knot. Okay, it's something. That, and I'm thinking of this maybe as charge circulating around. When I say charge, at least in my mind, this is nothing directly to do with the talk. But I'm thinking of what I say a, a primal sort of charge. In other words. Uh, this is this is stuff that naturally wants to repel. It, all the elements in that want to repel each other because you can't have two elements of things in the same place. So they're naturally going to spread out. But their motion, this thing cycling through, is causing it to move together. And I'm thinking, in my mind, this is a this would be a, a right-handed um, trefoil knot. If you did, took a mirror image of it, it would be a left-handed one. And I'm thinking, you know, we know that the electron is left-handed, the, pos the positron is right-handed. You know, there ought to be some structure that has, that actually literally consists of a flow that is left or right handed, such that two left handed ones are going to repel, two right handed ones are going to repel, but a left and a right would attract. And then we say that that's a positive particle and a left and a negative particle. Well, in fact, the positive and negative has nothing to do with the stuff itself, it has to do with the system of stuff. You follow what I'm saying? It's, in other words, positive and negative charge are system properties, they're not properties of the actual stuff. There's not two kinds of stuff, there's one kind of stuff that moves in two different kinds of ways. That's what, I, when I see this, I see all of that. <laughs> so I have to clarify, when I see this, you no, know, that could be a particle. Well, that's one example of a circuit. Um, interlocking rings, and now I could have more than one thing, so like Don had three interlocking rings in his structure, I maybe could have, this is, these are all toroids, knots just on the surface of a donut. And I could get more and more of them, and I could get all kinds of different structures just by playing with different numbers. And I could say, well, no, five is the right number, or ten, I don't know what the right number is. But that could be possible models. Uh, so, and the thing about these rings is, if you'll notice, for example, this one right here in the Sanyak Award, which is, uh, it's, it's three interlocking rings, but each of those rings is a circle. What I find fascinating about that is there is a, uh, what would call a topological torsion. And that's, that's a fancy word to mean that that although each ring by itself has no torsion, it doesn't loop around and make, it's just a circle. They're, they're working together. Their, their compositeness creates that, in this case, that is a left-handed one. If you, if you follow the white one and you follow along with there, you have to do it with your left hand as your thumb is pointing forward. You know, everybody kind of see what I'm saying? So a lot you can learn from these rings. And, and so this would be an example of what I call topological torsion. It's, the, it's the, not just the way that the pads individually twist around, but the way that they, as a group, the way that they're put together that they twist around. I find that fascinating. That's called a Hopf ring, by the way. There's another one called the Borromean rings, where if you take any one of them away, the other two don't interlock with each other. These two sets of rings are not topologically the same. So maybe that's a particle. That, that's my point here. I don't know. Uh, this is a toroid model that Bob the Hilster uh, built for me. And uh, the idea was that they have some light circulating around these circuits and have this whole table circulating around so you get this Christmas tree light effect. You're getting two simultaneous rotations around the, around the toroid and around the, the, the platform. And, uh, and as the frequency of one interacts with the frequency of the other, you can get quantized changes. Does everybody kind of see what I'm, what I'm saying when I talk about that? It's just like a roulette wheel. You know, you see it going backwards and then bam, all of a sudden it's going forward because you have a quantized change in the interaction of the frequency of the light, 60 hertz, with the frequency of the, of the roulette wheel going around. Or, or like an old wagon wheel in a movie. You know, the, the, the frame rate of the movie is interacting at one frequency, and then the, uh, the, the, the spinning of the wagon wheel itself is at another, and it looks like it's standing still, and then all of a sudden it's you know, going backwards, and then bang, it's going forward. We have a, you know, did it absorb a, a wagon on? You know, I mean, is there a particle there that it absorbed? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I think it's just, it, in other words, it's, it's, it's a quantized state, a change of state in the particle. And that's really, in my mind, that's all a photon is. 
I mean, it's not a thing. It's a change in the way the state of the particle is. But what is the actual structure of that particle? Well, there's a lot of possibilities. But I do think that it is going to be a circuit of some kind. Uh, my favorite model, Dr. Lucas is here, is the common sense model. Um, and then it's a great model. I, I don't say that it's the end of, you know, the, the end all model, but it certainly has a lot of good features. One of the things that's the best thing about the common sense science model is that they've actually done the math on it. They've actually said, hey, let's suppose this is a circuit of, you know, circulating charge, and let's see if we can figure out what the, you know, what David Bergman does it. He, he calculates the inductance of that, and he, he determines that the energy is stable. He finds the point at which it finds a point of stability, and he says, well, that's where it's going to, you know, that's where it's going to stay. Well, that makes sense, where the energy is lowest. So uh, he does that, and then he's found ways to combine rings into different structures, and that's been, a, uh, Dr. Lucas has been a big contribution for that. This is a possible model for the hydrogen atom. A bunch of circuits working together that have, by through their mutual inductance, are attracting, but also repelling by the fact that they're positive or negative in, in their, again, I think of that as being handedness. So these are great models as well. Um, there's Bergman's neutron. He's taken a, an electron as a ring, which is larger, but less dense, and the proton is another ring, smaller but more dense. The proton expands, they're, they're attracted to each other, the electron contracts, and they reach a new state of equilibrium with a new magnetic moment, which you can think of as being multiplied by the area of the separation, just this, this outer area. Uh, and that is a number that nobody else has been able to derive, and that's pretty amazing. Uh, that he was able to get the, it's an anomalous magnetic moment of the proton. So my challenge to anybody saying this or that is a neutron or this or that is a whatever, do the math. See if you can come up with numbers that agree with the magnetic, you know, uh, moments of, of these particles. Uh, David Bergman has done that. I don't say that this is the end all model because I, I don't think that they're just lines going in a circle. But they are, but this is a very good, the best I've seen so far. Let's put it that way. Okay, uh, Bradell structures are great. I, as I mentioned before, I love the idea of, you know, that the, that the condensation of energy is, is where we're going to see, you know, electrons and protons. I, I think the idea of a loop actually coming out of the nucleus and being part of that whole structure is brilliant. I, I really think that there's a lot to be said for that and a lot to be said for these different kinds of structures. I built this, by the way, a couple of years ago. I, I love making models. so. Anyway, I really appreciate Don's work in there too, but again, what do we need to do to make this thing come to reality? We've got to sit and model these things mathematically, and then we've got to figure out the fields and figure out what they do, and do they do, in fact, what Don is claiming that they do? I don't know yet, but that's going to take a lot of work. That's what we need to do. That's the challenge I want to put forward. So anyway, that's just a little bit of background on uh, Tom Lockyer's model. This is it in detail. And so all I'm going to do today is just kind of a... Uh, analyze his claims. He's claiming a lot of things with this, and I'm just saying, well, you know, are these claims valid? And um, that's all I want to do. Just kind of play with some toys and just and just do a little bit of math and see what what makes sense. But this is the picture that shows up in all of his books. And frankly, I have a hard time really understanding it. I think you know, and I talked to him about this. Uh, you know, there's a there's a for, for those of you who don't know, E is electric field, H is magnetic field, and and S is what we call the pointing vector. And there's a well-known equation in physics that says E cross H equals S. So if you think of your three fingers as being, um, you know, uh, mutually orthogonal, we have E, <laughs> e cross H equals S, okay? So those three vectors are, are normally uh, 90 degrees from each other. So he's, what he's imagining is there's a vector flowing along the edge of a cube, but then it turns and goes a different direction and comes back and makes a circuit. So each of these vectors is making a circuit. It's flowing along the edges of the cubes in different ways. And so he's saying, well, now the way you look at the, that how these vectors flow along the edges of the cube is determining what that thing is inside. Now, I don't know that I agree with all the details of his model, but in my opinion, that is a brilliant idea. And let me just, let me just take it a step beyond what I think Tom Lockyer is saying, and that is, there's a principle called um, uh, a Stokes, no, uh, well, let me, let me do Gauss's law first. Gauss's law, I think most of you know, you take a, a, a surface and you look at the electric field at every point on the surface and you add up all those contributions. And then you can say how much charge is inside. You don't know where it is inside or how it's distributed, but you know the total net charge just from knowing the field added at the surface. Okay, then there's another rule that, that's called Stokes' law that says if you look at the magnetic field going around a circuit, then you can know by adding up all the contributions to that field how much 
uh, current is flowing through that circle, or whatever or whatever surface you know also passes is bounded by that surface. That's a brilliant observation too. I am looking for something that's analogous to those two laws, but is quantized. And what I what I want, and I don't have yet, and but Lockyer is the first that I know that's really trying to do this, is to say, let's look at the fields on the surface of some you know a sphere or whatever. And let's see how they loop around, how they how they interact with each other, the electric field and the magnetic field, and see how many times they cross each other, and see how many times you know it does this or that. Okay, every time it does that, and every time it does some quantized event on the surface, we know that there's an electron inside. Or, oops, almost lost that. You, you see what I'm saying? There, there has to be. That's what I'm looking for. And I could say if it does it twice, then I know there's two electrons inside. And I don't, all I want to know is just how many times does this quantized thing happen, you know, that I can, that I can say, all right, this is it. And I believe it will be possible to come up with something like that. That's what I'm looking for, and that's why I'm interested in this model. So, I, I dropped my thing. Okay. So, it looks like he's claiming, uh, in this case, these, uh, the, uh, looks like the H field is going around the surface of the front face. The E field is going around the surface of the top face, and the S field is going around the surface on the side. But look at the directions, how they're going, and all these different things. Um, I'm, I put together what I thought were a set of rules that govern. He said, these are the only five ways it can work. I said, well, okay, well, let's find out what the rules are that, that, and then see if there really are only five ways. And that was really the purpose of this paper, was to see if that's true. I did confirm that there are only five ways. So, um, so that's good. Let's move on. So here are the rules. Okay, so everybody understands that these flows are going along the edges. They're going from corner to corner, and they continue to go until they get back to make a circuit. Okay? Then uh, all three fields, the E and the H and the S, every one of them flows into and out of each corner. Okay, so it goes from it goes from one corner to another, and goes from another, but they, but they all flow into that same corner, and they all flow out of that same corner. That's rule number two. Rule number three says no field can exit along the same one that it entered. It can't go into a corner and then go back. It has to go out through a different one, right? Otherwise, it's not a circuit. And then the other thing, the other rule is that each of the E, H, and S have got to be mutually orthogonal, coming into the set, to, coming into it, and coming out of it. And that's it. That's the rules. Okay. So everything else that I figured out about it, if I follow those rules, which are pretty straightforward, then I can figure out what are the possible ways to have these things flow around the cube that follow those rules. Everybody with me? Okay, so here's some of the consequences. I'll try to get through these quickly and, and hopefully they'll be, they'll be obvious. Uh, the flows never end, they have to circulate because if they didn't, then they couldn't flow into and out of every one. Okay? Uh, each flow has to go through exactly eight edges. Because there's eight corners, and it goes from corner to corner to corner eight times, and it has to end up coming back. So there's 12 edges, but it only each field only goes through eight of them. Does that make sense? Uh, that 90 there is part of this. <laughs> each field flows out of each corner at 90, 90 degrees, because it can't flow back. It's got to go around the next corner. So it's going to go 90 degrees, uh, either in a right-handed or a left-handed sense. And then no two vectors along a given edge can flow in the same direction. Otherwise, they would enter and exit in the corners in parallel. Okay, so if I had two of them coming in, then they, then they'd have to exit um, in parallel also. Okay, so that's what that that was that one. Uh, each edge may have at most two field flows, which must be in opposite direction. Okay, that's a consequence of what I just said. There has to be at least at most two field flows. Otherwise, it, they would be uh, flowing into the same corners. So I gotta have two along each edge. I gotta have an E and an S, or an E and an H, or an H and an S. Okay, I gotta have a two, at most two. But also, there's 24, there's 24 flows, because I got three vectors, each flowing uh, uh, along eight edges. That's, that's 24 flows. And there's 12 edges, so the most I can have is two. So the most I can have is two, the least I can have is two, I gotta have two. Okay? So that, that's my consequences. Oh, that stuff at the bottom is because those equations, I can't get those things to come in with everything else. Each pair of two fields, that is EH, HS, and SE, have to have exactly four shared edges. Because again, there's no only way that could happen is there's, there's, there's a total of uh, 12 edges, and they've got to be in three sets of three. Otherwise, 
the individual fields can't flow along exactly eight. You're kidding. <laughs> wow, this is going fast. Don't, nobody believes me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, the shared edges for each pair uh, cannot be to the corner or else the third vector would have to flow back. Um, again, they have to, they can't meet at a corner. Uh, in other words, if I've got, if I've got E and H on, on this edge, let's say this edge right here, I can't have E and H on that edge, otherwise the third one would have to flow into and out of the, 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 the third edge. Does that make sense? I hope I'm not going too fast for here. So that rule, that means I'm going to have a set of part, uh, uh, vectors for all those things. Uh, all those three fields are going to have to curl around each corner at a node at a 120 degree angle. And this is 120 degrees if you look at the corner, you get 120 degrees. So they're going to have to flow through those. In other words, it's going to have to go EHS, it's going to have to go EHS in the same order, rotate at 120 degrees, because you can't rotate one of them this way and rotate another one that, the other way, or they're just, then the third one would be swapped, it would be stuck right where it was. So they all have to go this way, or they all have to go that way. Does everybody get that? That's what I'm saying there. Um, Relationship between E, H, and S is either right-handed or left-handed. It's, it's E cross H equals plus or minus S. Now you say, well, that's, it's got to be plus S. Well, that's all really a convention. And the fact is, if it goes in one way, it has to come out the other. And that's a, that's a weakness of the model, in my opinion. But there you go. Um, and the sense of each triple is opposite of the exiting. That's what I just said. The, the exiting triple is opposite to the entering triple, the, the E cross H. So if one is positive, the next one is negative. So anyway, those are some of the consequences of those rules. So now it's time to get your handy dandy Rubik's Cube. What I did was I numbered each corner. And uh, so what I'm talking about now is setting up a numbering system. And I'm down to less than 10 minutes. So uh, to, to figure out how, how I can do these paths. So I have to exhaust all the possibilities. That's what I'm trying to do. So or you could just take any old cube, number it. And I had uh, Don Mitchell draw this drawing for me. I think it's beautiful. Uh, Anyway, you can kind of see this is a numbering system, which if you don't happen to have a Rubik's Cube handy, you can use this numbering system. What I did was I, um, I used Marco Rodin's Rodin uh, numbering system for the cube. <coughs> Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, what I meant to do is this. I, I, I have the pole, which is the point one, 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 if you can think of the Z, X, Y, and Z axis. That's, that's my plus three, and minus one, minus one, minus one is minus three. So I think of that as kind of, um, here's my three uh, up on top. There we go. That's, that's the North Pole and that's the South Pole. See what I mean? And you can kind of picture that in there. Then my Northern Hemisphere consists of a, a 1, a 4, and a 7. But the 7, I'm calling minus 2. Okay? Because of modulo 9, 7 modulo 9 is minus 2. It's the same thing. And then likewise, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, I have a 2, 5, and an 8. Which, if you know anything about Marco Rodin's uh, numbers, those are, those are huge. Anyway, uh, so I get what I get is uh, I get my three and my six, uh, or minus three, which is the same thing, uh, and I have these. And it's, it's an interesting way. If you know anything about Marco Rodin's numbers, it's an interesting way to kind of apply those numbers. I get those when I spin this thing 120 degrees. I get the same numbers, just adding three. So that way, I, I I've reduced my analysis by three because I only have to consider one case. I don't have to consider this case and this case too, because all I have to do is add three to everything. Modulo 9. I hope that wasn't too fast. I, what am I down to? Five minutes now? Okay. Uh, so then I just I numbered the coordinates. I, uh, again, you can think of it as plus, plus, plus. I said 3 was plus, plus, plus. Whoops. I didn't do that. And minus th 3 is minus, minus, minus. I just gave them numbers. If you want to think of it in terms of x, y, and z coordinates, you can do it that way. And then I said, oh, there's so much to say. Uh, group theory. This is there's a whole lot of things. This setting up of the cube this way. There's just a ton of information you can get about group theory about here. One thing that ah, I don't have time to discover this, but it's so cool. Uh, if you can do something called quaternion rotation. Quaternion rotation uh, is the idea. Um, uh, if I were to do a, a rotation of the ones and fours, and simultaneously do the rotation of the twos and threes, that would be equivalent to a, ro a quaternion rotation. If I do two of those, I invert the whole thing. And uh, so I basically have six possibilities. I could do a quaternion rotation around each of the six axes, or I could do an inversion, or I could do nothing. That's eight possibilities, and that's the quaternion group. So it's a, it's a really neat geometric way to envision the quaternion group. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen that before. I just made it up. 
but uh, I thought it was cool. Anyway, uh, the, the S4 group is also just, if you think about it, if you look at the faces of the group, you can get any permutation of one, two, three, and four by looking at the various faces. I happen to assign it this way, where if you, for example, the front, whoops, yeah, keep doing that. Uh, the front is plus three, minus two, minus four, plus one. Plus three, minus two, minus four, plus one. So that's the, that defines the front. So I, I had to set up this numbering system to even begin, and I'm at five minutes, I'm just now we're getting ready to get to it. Okay, so uh, one way to test the nomenclature, and I'm gonna have to skip through stuff, but is to just, just tr try a couple of paths. So here's a path you could try, let's do this one. Plus three, minus two, minus one, plus four, plus two, minus three, minus four, plus one, plus three. Did you see it kind of forms a little wicket? It goes up and down and up, up and around and down and, and goes through all eight of them? That's, that's a possible path. Turns out there's only two ways to do it. And I'm gonna skip forward because I'm running out of time. There's the wicket way, which is the path I just described. You can kind of see that path there. Or you can get a double loop where it just goes around in a square and the other one goes around a double square. There's no other ways to do it. That's it, that's all there is for one circuit. So first you have to figure out how many ways is there to do one circuit. Then you have to figure out how many ways are there to do combinations of three of those circuits. Okay, so that's what the next thing is. By the way, the wickets, which I call wickets because they look like a, a, a croquet wicket, except there's, there's wickets in both ways. They're amphichiral. You can see, what I mean by amphichiral is if you turn it over, if you, have, if you think of these as being a circuit with the, with the current running through and you use your hand to, to kind of move with the, current, with the current, and I don't have arrows in there, if you reverse the current, then the, the red becomes the blue and you just flip it over and it's the same thing again. So they're amphichiral. Does everybody kind of follow what I'm saying by that? So that's interesting, and that's a real important thing as far as understanding Lockyer's model, because he's claiming one of his uh, structures is amphichiral, but actually three of them are, and I'll show that, if I have time, I'll show that. But anyway, this is another one that Don Mitchell did for me. I think it's a pretty nice drawing, showing the amphichirality of the, what I call the wicked path. Um, so basically what I did was I exhausted all the possibilities, and every time, no matter what path I chose, I just always turned left, and then I, after I exhausted that, I would turn right. And eventually I ran out of possibilities and I would always get what I call B is, is the, the path that goes around the base and there's another one that goes around the front. And what I call DY is the down face with the Y bias. So it's a wicket with the Y bias. Does that make sense? And uh, so I, I, went, I just followed the path as best I could and then when I couldn't get to any further then I said it, that's, that's, the, that's the down face with the Y bias. So that's how I, that's my little nomenclature. Uh, so I tabulated all the possibility. Turns out there's three double loops and six wickets, that six ways to orient it. And the six wickets I showed you in that picture just above. So that's it. Okay, those are the only ways you can do it. And now the question is, what are the ways to do combinations of paths? And I'm really in a hurry, so I'm trying to get done. One combination is to have all double loops. You have all three colors. So for example, red could represent the electric field, the blue could represent the magnetic field, and green could represent the, the, the pointing field, the S field. And they're all going to have to go in the same direction. In other words, if you think of what I call U is the up face, so what I call U bar is the up face, but going in the other, other direction, reversing the flow. So these, what he, he says, are the positron and the electron are just that. They're all double loop for all three of them. And so those, those do correspond with what he's saying. So if you want to think of that as the positron, thank you, then that would be great. Uh, or the electron, that, that part I agree with. Um, and let's see, let's move forward here. Uh, then we want to look at, this was, this was the kind of the key insight. Remember I said earlier that there are four edges have to, have to uh, there have to be four shared edges for each pair of two. And so the only way you can get four edges that don't touch each other, that don't connect with each other, is either four parallel edges or what I call a cross pattern, which is down, which is two edges here. It kind of looks like this. Okay, I don't know if you can see the two on the top because the green is there to mess it up. Uh, but anyway, those are the only two ways you can share four, four edges. So each pair of two has got to have a pattern like that. And that's the key. If you then assign, that, assign to that, you say, well, what, what can that accept? Well, the, uh, the, the, uh, the wicket pattern cannot do the four parallel edges. It has to do the cross pattern. So there has to be a cross pattern associated with that, which means that, uh, that what's left, which once you choose a, if you choose a, a wicket, if you choose one wicket, then what's left over is also a cross pattern, which means there has to be another wicket. I hope that makes sense. And it turns out, and I know I'm running out of time, you have to have two wickets only use cross patterns. So choose a wicket, and then you, you find it's got to be shared by two other fields. So if you choose two wickets, it's unmatched pair with a double loop. So the conclusion is there must be an even number of wickets. So 
The only possible patterns, I hope all of this didn't lose you there because I'm trying to rush through it, is, is either all double loops or one double loop and two wickets. That's the only possibility. So here we got them all. Uh, and the, the, the question is, when you have two wickets, what I'm calling a wicket, I hope you all know what I mean by that, uh, and, and one double loop, whichever one is the double loop, thank you, is the one that identifies sort of the odd man out. So he's saying that the, uh, when the electric field is the odd man out, he calls that the muon type neutrino, or when the H field is the, the odd man out, he says that's a muon type, and when the electron, uh, when the S field, he says that's the uh, electron type. Well, in fact, all three of these are amphichiral. That's what I just showed. And, uh, and, and, and he's only claiming that this one is. And so I'm, I'm disagreeing with him there. I don't think that he's identified these two properly. I don't even know what a neutrino is or if one <coughs> exists. But, but he is correct in saying that there are only five possible ways to do it. The five possible ways being the electron and positron moving in forward or reverse direction. And then the three at the bottom, depending on which of the three is the odd man out, that's all the possibilities. So. Uh, what I, what I want to just, my summary is, here's again the models, I, each of these different ones is, is four pictures of the same thing, each emphasizing one of the different colors, that's all it, uh, that is. Uh, so that would be a model of two wickets with one double loop. So the point I want to get to is that uh, Tom Lockyer did this some 20 years ago, but I don't think he ever sat down and did this. And I want to encourage all of us, if we're going to develop models, we need to do the math, we need to do our homework, we need to really find out you know, if our claims are correct and not, you know, and that's what I really think is important for all of us to get better at doing. So thank you very much. We're going to have a break now. We'll be back in about 10 minutes.